good afternoon or good morning or good evening, everybody, uh, depending on where you're tuning in. Um, welcome to the interface. Uh, this webinar is about validity, neuroscience, and artificial intelligence. Uh, I'm Vahid Aryadus from the National Institute of Education of Nanyang Technological University of Singapore. In this webinar, which is the first of the interface series, and I'm hoping that there will be more webinars like this in the future, we aim to start a discussion or a dialogue, if you will, on three otherwise separate fields of research, artificial intelligence, validity, and neuroscience, and, and perhaps work towards defining a framework that uh, synthesizes and synergizes these three fields. Um, I have the pleasure and honor to host the first webinar today. Uh, I'll, I'll also have a, a short presentation after our guests will do their presentations. Um, so I would love to start this session by introducing the topics and the invited speakers. Um, we have three presentations for today. The first topic uh, that's gonna be presented by professors Bruno Zumbo and Brian Maddox is uh, clearing the ground for a holistic framework to support interpretation and use of process data in computer-based uh, assessments. The second topic, which is gonna be presented by Dr. Tahmina Zabin, uh, is explainable AI in educational assessment research. And the last topic, which I will present, will be uh, application of neuroscience in language assessment. So please allow me to unshare my screen and just give some time to Bruno and Brian to share this screen. And at the same time, I'm gonna introduce them to you. Of course, I don't think that they need really introduction. They are very well known in the field, but uh, I still introduce them, especially for those who may not be familiar with our presenters. So uh, let me see if, okay, good, the slides are on. All right, everybody. Um, our first presenters are Professor Bruno Zumbo and uh, uh, Brian Maddox. Uh, Bruno is professor and distinguished university scholar, the tier one Canada research chair in psychometrics and measurement and the Paragon UBC professor of psychometrics and measurement at the University of British Columbia. He is an internationally recognized mathematical scientist working on psychometric and measurement problems at the intersection of the behavioral, uh, social and health sciences. Over the last three decades, uh, Bruno's research program has influenced psych uh, psychometrics in validity theories, response processes, measurement invariance, and reliability. His insights into validity theory and measurement invariance have been twice recognized as a Killam Laureate Research and Teaching Awards and the uh, Samuel Messick Award. His co-edited volume entitled Understanding the uh, understanding and investigating response processes in validation research, which was published in 2017 by Springer Press, centers upon his explanation-focused view of validity and how that informs response processes, theories, and practices. Very welcome, Bruno. Um, and our second presenter, uh, um, co-presenting this, uh, this paper with uh, Bruno is Professor Brian Maddox. Brian is professor of uh, educational assessment at the University of East Anglia, the UK, uh, and the executive director of assessment microanalytics LTD, and also visiting professor at the Center for Educational Measurement at the University of Oslo, Norway. He specializes in the application of ethnographic and small scale uh, observational data on assessment response processes, including studies of eye tracking and gesture. Brian has conducted assessment research in quite a number of places, for example, in France, in the UK, Luxembourg, Mongolia, Nepal, the United States, Slovenia, and Senegal. Uh, his edited book on international large assessments in education is published by uh, Bloomsbury in 2019. So without any further ado, I would like to welcome our guest and pass the time to you. Uh, over to you, uh, Professors Maddox and Zumbo. Thank you so much. Um, this is a terrific honor and an absolutely wonderful idea. Vahid, please allow me to address you with a, 
uh, with uh, a sense of, of intimacy. We've known each other and know each other for many years, and I've uh, been um, so fond of, of, the, of the terrific body of work that you've created, and I'm so excited that you've, and, and Brian and I speak on, on behalf of Brian and I, we're so excited that you've invited us to launch this series. And um, today we're going to focus on, uh, the theme was exactly what uh, what was described at the beginning. We have a sort of a working title with it, which is Process Dead and Test Validity in Computer-Based Assessment. And, and we're trying to be somewhat playful, but also very serious about this notion of wrestling the kernels of truth from disparate views of, of response processes. I'm going to launch with a, a few words um, at the beginning with some of the slides, then turn it over to my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Maddox, and then um, I'll bring in some things towards the end. And Brian will jump in at any point if I stray too far away uh, from our theme. So let's set the stage a little bit from a quotation from a chapter of my 2007. I think it helps set the stage which is uh, for this whole session, in fact, I, I would argue perhaps even for, uh, to be so bold as to say for the whole interface series in some way, uh, particularly as it, re it deals with matters of validity, is the quotation was this in, in my, my 2007 chapter, integrating and summarizing such a vast domain as validity invites often rather facile criticism. Nevertheless, if one does not attempt to identify similarities among apparently different conceptual, methodological, and philosophic views, and to synthesize the results of various frameworks, we would probably find ourselves overwhelmed by a mass of independent models and investigations with little hope of communicating with anyone who does not happen to be specializing on our problem, our techniques, and our framework. And, and in fact, we're finding we, we it, it doesn't take much of a glance um, at the field of validation and, and, and validity in, in assessment to see some of that already, already beginning to emerge. So uh, Brian and I, motivated by this observation, say, then turned and said, hence in the interest of avoiding the monotony of that, of the latter state of affairs, even thoroughly committed specialists am among us must welcome occasional attempts to compare, contrast, and, and, and rest the uh, kernels of truth from disparate response process positions. And that's really a, a characterization of our aim. Um, we, we will make a sort of a, an open position here that, that perhaps may seem bold but to some, but really there is no consensus among assessment researchers about many of the central problems concerned with response process data. For example, what is it? What is it comprised of? Uh, what are the purpose? Uh, uh, the the uh, um, what are the, the purposes and aims of its use, and whether it can or even should reveal the truth or meaning about un unobservable things like constructs or mental processes, and whether it can be really even justified at all. Although response processes are often listed as sources of evidence to enhance assessment design or or or, or validity evidence we seldom see conceptualization of response processes. Rather, the focus is on the techniques and methods of assembling response processes or indices or, st or statistical models. And in fact, in some cases, they don't even address directly anything about validity or validation per, per se, and we'll come back to this. Validity or validation maybe sits in the water, in the air, uh, in the things around the ideas and the work, but it's not, it's not explicitly directed to that. And here's the, I, and a recurring thing that we, in the whole field of the social sciences, and one would argue perhaps even in the, uh, in the, the natural and physical sciences, over and over again, this is where we find ourselves. And again, we find ourselves, uh, we did historically in, in, in the area of, of validity, and again, we're finding ourselves in, this when it comes to response processes, is that method overrides clear definitions and as a field, we therefore conflate method and methodology, much like we conflate validity in, and validation. And the distinction between method and, and methodology here is important. We dive in, even if you look at the test, uh, at the a, a, um, APA, NCME, AERA test standards, 
even looking at them historically, it's often described in terms of method. Um, so last points, and then I'll turn it over to my uh, colleague, Brian. This is not to say that important conceptualizations have not been offered in the field. In fact, we make these statements at the beginning, these bold claims about uh, what's going on in the area of response or not going on in the area of response processes. It is not to suggest that, that you know, important conceptualizations have not been offered. Quite to the contrary. Our, our first aim is to review some prominent conceptualizations of response processes to clear the conceptual ground makes it possible for extensive and richer uses of response process data to increase uh, test validity. In doing so, we're going to try and locate process data within the five sources of validity described in the test standards and within established theories and practices of validation and, can, and to consider the validity of its of the, the validity of the use of response processes as evidence of test taker performance. At this point, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Brian. Brian will give me a nod and I'll do a, uh, and I'll be as good at it as I can at following instructions and changing slides. Brian. Thanks very much, Bruno. Um, yeah, um, can you go to the next slide? Wonderful, wonderful. Um, so thank you very much. Um, what I'm going to do is to start by presenting some of the um, um, established um, or at least working definitions um, of uh, response processes and how they re relate to uh, validity. Uh, and then I'm going to explore some of the challenges that that, that, that they might involve. So um, just to um, this opening slide here that I'm presenting um, uh, is drawn from two um, really very useful books on the topic, both uh, um, coincidentally published in 2017. Uh, the one at the top is a very tidy definition of response processes. Um, I'll just read it out. Response processes refer to the thought process strategies, approaches and behaviors of examinees when they read, interpret and formulate solutions to assessment tasks. Now, uh, if I was teaching um, this topic, I would be inclined to uh, use a definition like that of response processes because it's very tidy and quite short. And it's this, the kind of thing that people feel like they can get their head around. It's quite practical. Uh, it looks like, looks like it's quite usable and to some extent slightly unproblematic. Um, and you can see that it's actually mixing up a number of different themes, um, thought processes, you know, the internal things, but also external externally ob observed uh, uh, um, behaviors. Um, so that's that's quite interesting. He's got that inner and uh, an external kind of um, a sense there. But if we go on to the second definition by um, Hubley and, and, and Zumbo, uh, Bruno, who's here, um, the mechanisms that underlie what people do, think or feel when interacting with and responding to the item or task and are responsible for generating observed test score variation. This definition expands response processes beyond the cognitive realm to include emotions, motivations, and behaviors. So already uh, with this definition, we're, we're getting a sense that things are actually more complex. Um, a bit like the, the, the top definition, there's this, there's this sense that there's something underlying. Um, in the in Aristotle and Pellegrino, uh, they talk about thought processes. In the Hubley and Zumbo definition, they talk about things that mechanisms that underlie, uh, but include uh, thinking and feeling. So it's expanded to include uh, the cognitive and also these other themes, emotions, motivations, behaviors. So you can see that it's already got quite complicated um, and um, somewhat um, uh, more complex. And yet uh, there's this idea there in that definition that these are responsible for generating observed score variation. So there's some kind of loyalty there to the uh, notion of, for example, construct relevant uh, variation, which I think we want to start to explore a bit further and unpack um, in terms of how we might use uh, uh, response process data and what might, might or not be, be valid uses of that. Okay, thank you, Bruno. Next slide, please. Okay, now, um, I. I'm an anthropologist, um, and so excuse me if things get a little bit more messy here in terms of definitions. Um, 
the image you can see on the on the right there is an image from my own um, field work a few years ago in Senegal looking at PISA for development. Um, uh, in this case, as a young boy um, using a um, tablet for a, a large scale standardized assessment. But you can see from the ethnographic uh, data here, the image of the interaction that you've got a test administrator who is supporting the, the young, young boy to, um, to um, interact with the um, assessment. So there's a lot of things happening there which are not captured, for example, on the, on the log data. Uh, the log data will not capture any of that uh, observed uh, intera embodied interaction which is going on between the test taker and the administrator. So what I've tried to do is to try, try to look at the, the wider, from an anthropological point of view, the, the wider uh, set of characteristics. Uh, so I, I have a sort of working model which, uh, of response processes, which I've, I, I'll share here. Uh, assessment response processes involve the cognitive and affective dimensions of test taking with respect to the various temporal, spatial, embodied, material, interactive, and social cultural characteristics of the testing situation. It doesn't, it just doesn't run, run off the tongue in, this, in the same kind of way as, as some of the shorter definitions. And yet, and yet I would, I would ask if there are any of those dimensions that you think are somehow not relevant to response data. And so we realized that perhaps there is a lot of complexity involved. So as a result then, response data, response process data and interpretation and validation, um, it requires validation to establish whether it can be used as an adequate and valid explanation for variation in test scores or some other aspect of test taking experience. So for example, we might use it for, uh, to, to make inferences about uh, engagement or motivation or, or some other, other dimension. Thank you, Bruno. Okay, so, um, I think before I pass back to, to Bruno, I want to just to sort of highlight then, um, I think one of the sort of defining uh, questions, I think, which relates to our presentation, but perhaps also to other presentations today and in the series, um, is the extent to which response data in its broad or complex uh, forms and its sources uh, somehow complies with what we would understand in the field uh, in terms of validity. So we look at the Messick um, uh, um, quote, and actually going back to the, the Hubley and Bruno, uh, Hubley and Zumbo um, definition, uh, there is something there which is saying that actually the question is the degree to which the data supports inferences and actions based on on uh, on on the data. However, I um, when we've looked at it, we've come to the conclusion that very often uh, we actually have two. A, a data for, which has a different ontological status. So test designers, for, for example, who are designing uh, with intention, uh, designing tests to produce scores which will be valid and that will demonstrate uh, appropriate variation. There's an intentionality there. Whereas when we look, start to look at wider um, data, such as, for example, um, facial expressions or, or gaze or some other physiological measure, uh, there's not a particular reason why those would um, necessarily be compliant with the expectations that we would have as test designers. Um, so um, data particularly that's produced as a byproduct uh, may, maybe has a different ontological status. And as a result, there's a question there in terms of how we validate it about uh, the um, what's required in order to, to, to do that validation process. Um, for example, whether uh, uh, embodied or physiological responses are, are, are in any way reliable or compliant with the kind of standards that we would normally have uh, for interpretation of, of, of data. Thank you, Bruno. I think it's back to you, Bruno. Am I right? Is there... uh, one, more. Uh, one more slide, sorry. Um, so uh, just the, the, the same point, really, which is that um, you know, various uh, sources of process data, such as log files, uh, data from sensors and probes, uh, we might view it as having a measurement opportunity. In other words, it's there, we could possibly use it. Uh, but there's a question about whether it actually uh, um, has the characteristics of validity that we would expect uh, in, in interpreting it uh, as assessment data. Uh, uh, this image I'll just mention briefly is again from my own research. 
Um, this is a, um, a French schoolboy um, who is completing a, a maths item. And as you can see, he's taking time out with his head on his hands to have a good think about how he responds. Well, the interesting thing there is that he's not interacting with log data. There's no keystrokes going on. Um, there's not even any eye tracking data going on because he's got his eyes closed and his head in his hands. There's something going on there, but it's not picked up by various sensors that we might assume are reliable. Um, and so it, it, there's, a, there's a tension there between what's actually going on in the human, the human encounter with the assessment and what we're actually able to capture. Uh, over to you, Bruno. Thanks so much. Excellent, Brian. Thank you. And, and the, the one transition remark that I think is uh, interesting here, it's an idea that, um, that, that I introduced briefly in that 2017, at, in that 2007 chapter, which is validation as jazz. And it's an, it's an idea that Brian and I uh, picked up in a chapter that we wrote and we contributed to the volume that was edited by uh, by me and Anita Hubley. And you can see that the work that's doing here, the kind of ideas that, that Brian and I are, are exploring is really you get now this notion of really a validation as jazz. It's not just a series of, of, of um, cookbook um, steps. It's, it's a far more nuanced idea here. Um, there's a few slides I just want to say a bit about here now in transition is really we, we want to now unravel this a little bit and then bring it back together, wrestle it and some kernels of truth of it. And there's really two main points that I, we want to make in, in the remaining slides that are that, that, that emerge from uh, Brian's um, very tidy and very lovely um, uh, synthesis of, of uh, some uh, sort of prominent views of what our response process is. Um, the, the two key points is that, that long before tests were administered by computers, test developers and, and um, test designers, uh, individuals doing validation, they, they were interested in process data long before anything happened on uh, a test were delivered or administered on a computer per se. And that's an important point because um, there, what the computer has done in uh, doing the delivery on a computer, it's given us this, um, this uh, um, tremendous sort of uh, power and versatility that come from these emerging technologies that, the, um, that are digital. You can begin to now bring neurophysiological and other kinds of probes. I like Brian's idea of probes in here, and uh, and sensors. And the idea, well, the probes actually goes back to Messick, but but Brian's idea of sort of of sensors. They sort of everything from fine grained eye tracking sensors of detailed movement uh, of a computer interface by a mouse or or other kinds of pointers. You can now do all these response time. And so one of the two points that we we want to highlight. Well, the first one is comes right in in, in the title, which is that. People were interested in response processes long before assessments were delivered on computers. And what emerges from that, the first thing that emerges from that, from that is this in, in, incredibly fascinating idea is that there's a sense of, of inevitability. Oh, look, a computer has a clock and it can record it to milliseconds. Well, therefore, as dropped from the heavens, the clock time must be useful for assessment. If not, why, why does a computer have a clock? Friends, computers have had clocks for a long time before they, they delivered assessments, right? And, and they weren't there for assessment. Uh, and so there's this a sense of, of inevitability. Therefore, response time must be, be, be something that we can use, and we just have to find the right way to use it. But Brian, I want to put a little bit of a pause on that, challenge some of that, not throw it out, but challenge the sense of inevitability. Same thing with the beautiful body of work in the neurophysiological measures. Galvanic skin response was is an old measure um, in the in the psychophysiology literature. Um, it, it wasn't developed for assessment. Why? Functional MRIs, very powerful tools, uh, but is it? In what way do we need to get this sense of inevitability 
wrestling it out a little bit. Another key element here is that response process data has been around for a long time before it was delivered on computers. And, and you can get, there's an explicit use of it, and it towards validity and validation and test design. Uh, Anita Hubley and I, in that opening chapter of the edited book, we, we, we point to the work by Roger Lennon in 1956 in Insight Measurement. I want to read for you the opening chapter, uh, the opening paragraph by Lennon, opening paragraph, 1956. And if you close your eyes and imagine you're reading Vahid's paper from last week, and it could just as easily be written by in one of Vahid's papers last week. If I didn't tell you if it was Lenin, 1956, Lenin writes, the concept of validity of educational psychological tests and diagnostic aids has been the subject of increasingly penetrating, sophisticated analysis as befits its central position in test theory. While it cannot yet be asserted that our notions of validity are as fully elaborated or even as generally agreed upon as might be desired, we have assuredly come a long way from the time when the classical definition of validity is the extent to which a test measures what it purports to measure could be, regard, could be regarded as adequate. So for those of us, including myself, I need to be reminded, all of us need to be reminded, he's, this is not a new idea, 1956. Lenin actually connects it to content validity. Perhaps the, from there, even before computer, it, listen, we're, we're not gonna have a debate whether 1956 the desktop computers, computers in 1956 were, uh, you know, floors of buildings. They're not this, my phone, which really isn't a phone. It's a camera. I, I write to Brian. Uh, I talk to my wife, I, uh, you know, my family. I mean, it's not, but I don't talk to them. I text them. I video them. I, if I get a phone call now, it's because something horrible has happened in the world. Uh, so my phone isn't really a phone. It's a big, massive computer that fits in my hand. 1956. A computer was a room. Well, it was a floor. In um, oops, sorry. the The other point that I want to I want to highlight is that Susan Embertson has by far been the most extensive, as by far created the most extensive program of research on response processes as validity evidence, and and it describe and it contributes to the description and understanding of, of test performance dating back to at least 1977. Uh, Whiteley 1977 is, is, uh, is Susan Embertson uh, in later years. Um, so Embertson, even in, in 1977, there wasn't an administration of tests on the computer. There was also some less explicit connections in assessment to the, the to, uh, uh, and response processes to validity and test design. Uh, for example, there's this beautiful body of work on response processes and process scoring. Uh, it comes out of some of it comes out of the the uh, the uh, long-standing body of literature in neuropsychological test process responses, at least to the early 1970s. I remember uh, I'm not a specialist in this area, but I, I happen to have shared my life at one time with a uh, a, a very good um, a neuropsychologist, uh, um, and uh, you know, I was reminded. I would hear, the, you know, Edith Kaplan's work, 1988 in particular, but earlier work on you know process scoring, and that you were there, you were quantifying find the errors or other aspects of an individual's performance that allows one to determine how and why an individual achieved an outcome reflected by the total score. That's clearly response processes, not validity validation. It was done uh, before it was done on a, on a computer. So process scoring as well in, in, in writing assessment, math and science assessments, partial scores. These are all examples of process, response processes before we put them on a computer. So this is an important point. But the key thing, so we want to challenge this inevitability. At the same time, we don't want to throw these notions out. Two more slides, and then I'm going to really um, um, hand it over to our colleagues. I just, uh, just to remind you of the time, we have around eight minutes left. Perfect. I'm not even going to take that long, but thank you, Vahid. Thank and you. if I if I get um, a little too excited and keep going, 
uh, just mute me and drop me off the call and I'll, I'll keep talking. You can sign on again in about an hour. I'll still keep going. And no, I'm teasing you. This is a good, thank you, Brian. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Vahid. Um, so Brian and I wanna now bring in two examples of um, that are quite interesting sort of contrasting cases um, on the use of response uh, processes. I'm trained, uh, my original training is a, is a, uh, as a, as a mathematician. So if I don't feel, if I don't see equations, I get a little bit uh, nervous. Um, so these are as much for me as, as they are for you. Uh, again, that was, that was supposed to make you all smile a little bit, but we're going to give you two examples here. Um, and th these two examples really um, explore um, and they contrast a very important idea uh, about response processes. And it, 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 something that's hanging in the air in, in terms of response processes is that it is, um, there's a sense of proximity to us to the score. So in the response process, that by itself invokes some notion of space and time. And so as a mathematician, when I speak process, we would, I would think about space and time defined in some way. And so space and time is involved here, but what is the space and time? Well, it's somewhat useful to think about it. And I've done this in, in, my, own, in my own writing and thinking is, thinking about sort of an SR stimulus response kind of idea. And you'll actually see it in uh, Cronbeck and Meal. And sort of mental processes, one can be in the old theory of, 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 of learning, would be um, that thing that occurs, those things that occur somewhere in the space between stimulus, which in our case are the item tasks, and response. To, to the task. So in space and time, something in, t in that space, in, in that location is where response processes se seem to have a, a key role. And I wanna contrast, as, as I think others have done this as well, we wanna contrast uh, one use of response processes, which is to understand or explain item responding. And there's particular kinds of, and we would argue particular kinds of derived process variables that are relevant here versus that in this space time where it's closer right in this space which is really space and time closer to the re reported or, or produced response and i'm you know i still come from a test theory point of view um mathematically and you can either think of it as either item or or um their item response or test response. This is, is an example of how one can do this very generally as a, as a, as a, as a, as a type of, of, st of statistical model. Uh, Bayesian uh, generalized linear mixed models have been around uh, for, for several years now, well, probably about 20 years in some form or longer. Um, uh, and, uh, Andrew Gelman uh, and, and others have written extensively about this, but here's one characterization of it. So here's a, a Bayesian uh, a GLIM model for item, respo item responses regressed onto process variables. And what I'm, what I'm trying to show here, I'm not going to worry about this too, too much. Here's a regression, in this case, Y being the item response. This, think of it as your linear regression, where, and I write it as a mixed model, which is you know both fixed and random factors. But in here, this X and this Y, these are the derived process variables. But the key element here is that they should be correlated to the item responses. So at this point, if you're using these kinds of process variables, they may be, uh, you may have someone in a functional MRI and a magnet, if you happen to have that kind of, of resources and you're doing, um, mental rotation tasks, or they're doing a writing assessment or a reading, or you're measuring response time or something. In this context here, these process variables have a different feel. And you're going to see in a few moments how we conceptualize them. And this is one of the points that I think Brian has, one of the several points that Brian has brought to our field, is that to ask the question of how do we validate and study the quality of 
process variables themselves. This is something that I, I really see Brian highlighting. Here's one example. This is a, a very fancy looking regression. Uh, it's meant to, to highlight the complexity and to intimidate Brian, who's the anthropologist, so he doesn't, you know, um, so he, he lets me keep talking. Brian, I hope it's working. It's terrified you a little bit. Here's another example. Now it's at the case, uh, someone smiled when I said that. I hope Brian did too. Here's it is at a case where now we're looking at in this space time, and there's many other possibilities in this space time between, if you wish, the, the, um, the presentation of the stimulus, the, the task or the question, and the production. Here now we're, we're going closer towards one getting a, a quote unquote better um, a test score that one can report better in some statistical sense. Uh, smaller standard of measurement, less bias, or other such notions. Um, so, for example, we we can now think of it in some sort of um, item response model. There's sort of a, a two-level hierarchical structure. This is not uncommon. You'll see variations on this. Uh, in in, uh, in it's and it, actually what it is a type of latent variable regression. Actually, uh, Bob Mislevy and others have written about this. I've written on this. Um, and here, what you have now is you have a regression built into here though. So this part here, so here you can think of it as an IRT model. This is the conditional probability. Uh, y being your, again, the same thing, your item responses. X now is um, is your your um, your derived response process variables. So you have a regression component uh, here where uh, the process variable is somehow uh, regret, uh, so the theta is regressed onto the po process variable as a way of getting a quote unquote better, more uh, uh, more accurate, for example, estimate uh, prediction. Actually, it's not a it's more accurately described as a prediction. Well, we use estimate in, in the literature all the time, but a prediction of this theta that we can then report, and that this so this use now says that the process variables should be correlated with the attended measured con phenomena, the construct itself. And this is what I'm trying to contrast in these ways. The use here is quite different, and the kinds of process variables that may be here, how we conceptualize them, is different, we would argue, in this element of the, this aspect of the space-time between stimulus and response, than it is in, in the previous example. Very well, last yeah, one minute left. I was. Uh, this is beautiful. I this is my last slide. Okay, nice. Uh, um, so there, uh, um, uh, Brian and I rehearsed these things. But hey, this is you know we're timed. I've used ten seconds of my last minute, but here we go. These <laughs> the examples that we're using here are really to sort of shore up, help us wrestle some kernels of truth uh, in these two examples and in linking them to the definitions that Brian was in the theories. The validation of the process variables will depend on their use, their source, the sensors, and their conceptualization. These two examples contrast how process variables can be used to statistically inform. Uh, there are other ways of doing this, but we're focusing on the statistically informing test scoring and development. And that's it for us, unless, um, uh, unless Vahid, you wanted uh, or Brian had anything to add, I'm I'm now uh, um, done at this end of it. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. You want to add anything else, or no? No, it's um, oh. wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brian and Bruno. I really enjoyed listening to you. Uh, there was a lot for me to learn and digest. Uh, I've taken some notes and I have some questions uh, which I will ask later during Q&A. I just realized that I had forgotten to, uh, to announce that to the audience that uh, because someone asked uh, about the timing for each presentation, yeah, every presentation is around 20 minutes roughly. Um, so um, that's the end of the first uh, presentation. Thank you very much again. Let's move on to our second presenter, uh, Dr. Tahmina Zbin. And uh, I'm going to introduce her very briefly. Uh, Dr. Zabin is a lecturer in the uh, School of Computing Sciences at the University of East Anglia, the UK, and is one of the academics at UEA working on the uh, 
Undrive and Explainable Artificial Intelligence. Following her PhD, Tahmina was employed as a postdoctoral research associate uh, on the EPSRC funded project entitled Wearable Clinic, Self-Help and Care at the University of Manchester and was a research fellow in health innovation ecosystem at the University of Westminster. Her research expertise includes advanced image and signal processing, explainable AI, debiasing algorithms, human activity recognition, risk prediction modeling using various statistical and deep learning techniques. She has worked on projects relating to disease detection from endoscopic videos and human activity recognition from wearable sensor data. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to welcome you, Tahmina, and uh, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, good afternoon in Singapore, guys, and it's morning in the UK. So can you guys see my slides? Okay. Okay. So as Vahid said, I'm a lecturer in computing science in the University of East Anglia. I mainly do data science, machine learning and AI for my te teaching and research. So today, as it is a topic on educational assessment and validity aspects of it, I'd like to highlight some of the aspects of computer-based based Test, test taking and use of automated analysis of the process data using various machine learning techniques. Let's say some challenges we currently have in terms of modeling, I'd like to highlight some of those. So let, let's begin by looking into various ways of uh, various ways automation is being used in education research now. So if I move on to my next slide, you would see that there are a lot of automation that has been brought into various learning platforms and virtual facilitator. There are some smart content development going on using recommendation engines. So let's say, depending on your ability, we are suggesting what topic could be suited for you next. There are intelligent tutoring system that are being brought into. Uh, we at the UK with Brian's company, we work on some online proctoring solutions for the computer-based testing environments or online testing environments. There are fraud management or quality assurance aspects of things where uh, automation is being brought into. There are many others, so some of the points that I have taken are coming from the GM Insights website. So I'm pretty new to the field of education research. I'm more of an applied AI solution developer. So I've been working with Brian's team in at Assessment Microanalytics on their inclusive and ethical AI product development. So my experience is more coming from that experience. And as you know that most machine learning models rely on the data that we can feed into those models. And if I now look into some of the data side, the data sources that I might get as an algorithm developer while trying to build automated decision support system, the types of data would probably, as you have heard about some of those already, it could be log data on response time, keystrokes, and uh, video and audio recording are currently available from, let's say, if the exam is happening online, the participant is being monitored uh, for uh, an audio around the participant is kind of a quality assurance capture. You can also uh, keep uh, capture eye tracking data. Uh, this could be screen mounted or wearable. There are movement towards employing wearable sensors to understand, capture a bit more information on movement and physiology. There are some, uh, it, during the test development phase of the computerized tests, there are some think aloud uh, capture that can also be done depending on wh whether the part what the participant is thinking when they are encountering a test item. Slightly low tech and uh, be, Brian being an anthropologist or digital ethnographer, there could be some data collected by the uh, observation of the invigilator. So these are more of intuitive, contextualized or rapid insights of the test environment. So displaying this many data 
there are many ways you can capture what's happening in a test taking environment. The validity issue in terms of algorithm development that I'm going to talk about is more around fairness. So I'm displaying here the American Research uh, Association, Educational Research Association's definition of fairness, and they commented on that fairness is a fundamental validity issue and it requires attention throughout all stages of test development and use. Uh, so though we have lots of data, different modes of process data are subject to partiality, bias or various forms of measurement error. And you would see that uh, if I move on to my next slide where the slide title is talking about automated gesture and video analysis. So while talking about bias, a recent blog published in Harvard University's website highlighted that for automated facial recognition techniques, most of the tech giants such as Microsoft, IBM, Amazon, and these kinds of companies, there have their automated uh, algorithms to do facial recognition and algorithms are mostly as good as the data that you have used to train them. So if your data set was, let's say, mostly lighter skinned male or female, and there is a minority group of people, when you are testing them in the test phase, as during training phase, you did not have enough data for the minority group, it showed that the test for performance of these automated algorithms are, let's say, for one of the groups, 20% less than the uh, majority group that was uh, being presented during the test phase. So as researchers of algorithm, uh, our developer for algorithms, our objective should be to apply fair and explainable AI methods to identify and mitigate against bias. So we do have now toolboxes to do, look into black box algorithms, machine learning algorithms that we are using. And there are explainable AI methods that we can look into, let's say to highlight where the algorithm is failing. And once you know what's not working, you can have special methodologies applied to mitigate against those bias. And for educational research purposes and validity point of view, Brian and I discussed that, okay, there are automated emotion recognition algorithm where you can, let's say, infer whether the, this person is happy, sad, uh, surprised, and things like that. We thought that rather than generalizing what this person is feeling, it's better to have factual observational video analysis. So when we are applying video analysis to analyze what's happening with the participant, it would be better to tell what's happening rather than suggesting this person is currently uh, stressed or surprised or things like that. So our uh, suggestion for any video analysis applied to educational validity testing would be rather than using generalized emotions is probably to have factual observational video analysis uh, rather than generic behavior inference. So as I say, to ensure fairness, explainable AI is the way to go for. It reinforces the concept of ethical and principled AI. And under explainable AI, we currently do have a lot of things covered. So let's say when we say the first objective that we are trying to gain with the explainable AI is transparency. So if you say I have used multiple process variables while inferring something, I want to make sure I want to be able to see what the algorithm used in its decision making. Or in terms of reliability, we, we want to see how the algorithm, how robust that algorithm that we are, we have developed against, let's say, changes in parameters and various inputs. Trust is another thing that comes when you are providing the users with a transparent system. When you can see the underlying decision-making process, it's uh, for the users, it's uh, easier to, uh, let's say, believe that system or 
when you know how it is working, it's easier to trust that system. And fairness is the thing that comes with it. Let's say if I have explainable AI methodologies, I have ways of verifying, okay, whether my model's decisions are fair over uh, protected groups of particip participants that I am using this decision support system for. So this diagram, I'm taking it from a very recent paper from you know, Fioc uh, et al. Uh, they wrote a topic on explainable artificial intelligence for education and training, and they highlighted what question we could answer if we have an explainable AI system. My next slide is talking about algorithmic improvement. So as I showed in one of my previous slides that Algorithms are not fair to the minority group of participants because the training phase did not see the data from that group enough. So we need algorithmic in improvement and uh, in terms of computer, computerized test environment development, uh, as we are developing these systems to improve accuracy and drive objectivity in various application areas, we, the team at the UEA, are trying to formulate the good and best practices that we, th we can think of, uh, depending on the other users and other developers' understanding of the field. And we are making algorithms that are tailored for the need for, let's say, specific linguistic community, including the cultural context. So various participants from various cultural back background, their responses to a test environment would be different than, let's say, someone coming from another cultural uh, or geographical context. And it requires special attentions for, let's say, to support the test environment for people with special, like, special needs. And as you can imagine, test takers are persons, not merely cognitive processes, to be honest. So with our capture of data and while we are feeding that data to, let's say, extract features, process variables to be used by automated machine learning models, we need to be aware that these are the things we need to provide special attention to. So Tell as algorithm- eight minutes is left for you. Yes, please. Uh, I should be able to finish in time. Great, thank you. So, our, our uh, way to go forward is multimodal solution. And we say that, let's say, various mode of process data capture has various strengths and weaknesses. And if we are, let's say, Brian was showing one of the cases where the user did not have any eye tracking data because he had his head on his hand or he is resting his head on his hand while thinking about his or, or using a paper and pen based environment. So we can have image and video or webcam analysis data to complement those missing information. And when we do have multimodal data, it requires quite a bit of co-learning and cross-modal representation. It also needs alignment between modalities. Uh, it requests efficient fusion of the modalities that we are using. And once you have multimodal solutions, uh, these algorithms could be very powerful in, let's say, providing you with various test item insight. And it has some aspect of the usability or UX design aspects. And as, as if we can use the automated systems that can give you insight into how various variables or test taking environment variables are being used in decision making. You can improve the usability or EX design to meet the needs for a community. And we can see a great opportunity to contribute that because we have data, evidence-based evidence analysis on the accessibility and inclusivity of the UX design uh, of any test. We can also monitor the participant interaction with the interface and we can look into look for interaction with the test item and depending on that interaction that we are seeing with the test item you can let's say infer strengths and weaknesses in those items let's say what's working in a in a digital test taking environment. And we can then formulate various validation tests based on the observation or ethnographic finding from various user groups. So 
uh, I would, I'm nearly to the finish of the things and in educational research, uh, the needs are explainable AI and impl implication of current practice. We want to give the users or stakeholders the trust that, let's say, if there is an automated system developed, they, if a user is asking, what does the system believe about me? Or how does, why does it believe, let's say, if the um, model or the automated decision system inferred something, why did it infer in that way? And what does the data, where does the data coming from? So these are the things we need to be able to answer. And the content that I'm displaying in here is coming from a 2020 paper from Kay and Zapta. So our design principle for XAI systems, this is again taken from a very recent paper by Mueller et al. And what we need to aim when we are developing any automated system is we need to provide enough explanation to the system. And though nothing is intrinsically explanatory, and explanation may have different consequences. We need to involve the users that the system will be used for as early as possible. We need to promote active self-explanation. We need to have combined methods whenever necessary. And there are differences in terms of explanation in the cognitive sciences and the XAI domain. And algorithm can perceive, let's say, as much as you're coding it to perceive, whereas in real life, there is some difference, difference on it. So if I can summarize what I'm trying to deliver today is that for, uh, let's say, process data processing, uh, specifically with my experience of, let's say, facial expression and gesture analysis, uh, commercial solutions are currently lacking in various aspects. And state-of-the-art prediction models that are commercially available are is still inadequate to, let's say, perform fairly for all the group of people that we are dealing with. So we need tailored solution if we want to employ these methodologies for educational research. And understanding what's happening in the black box, uh, it becomes feasible with expl explainable AI methods. And if we know what's not working, we can have uh, additional processes or algorithmic aspects involved in our design that can mitigate the known risk and introduce trust into human and AI interactions. Uh, I probably have a minute only. So what, as I said, I, I develop machine learning models and I do work on explainable AI. So with the current AI technology, I developed a few dashboards recently using some of the explainable AI toolboxes. Currently, it is possible to, let's say, break down. So the, the slide that I'm showing on the screen is a model developed to, let's say, decide a benign or malicious traffic coming into a web in interface. So there are some normal transactions or normal web interaction, and there are some benign and there are some malicious web interactions. And if I have used various variables for, from that web communication and developed a model with the explainable AI tools nowadays, you can, let's say, look into what parameter contributed in the model's decision-making of, uh, let's say, the instance that I'm showing in here is a normal communication and what did the model use from that parameter space to get to its, let's say, final decision making of I'm 86% confident that this transaction is normal. So you can get into as much detail as you want to in terms of how that decision was made by the automated system that we have. So we are there in turn, there are various toolboxes available now. It's up to us how we are using it to inform our understanding and inform the developments that we can make. So I'd like to conclude here on the references that I used are these. And some of the contents were coming from, let's say, Brian's and Naomi's uh, uh, presentations from assessment microanalytics. I learned quite a bit from Brian YouTube series, and I have uh, the, one of the explainable AI slides that 
where comparing the neuro neuroscience aspect of ex um, explanation is coming from an AQA presentation by the Caesar. So that would be it from me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Tahmina. It was really an exciting presentation. I enjoyed listening to you. And likewise, I have questions later during the okay. Q&A time for you as well. And I, so I also have a, a brief presentation. I would like to uh, think that it's gonna be brief. I don't know how brief it will, it will be, perhaps as brief as 20 minutes only. Uh, so um, let me share the screen. And Azrifa, my student is here. Azrifa, are you around? Could you perhaps uh, keep the time for me? I mean, if, if you heard me, I hope you can keep the time for me just in case I go over, uh, run over time. Reminds me, please. So I'm sharing my screen with you. I hope you can see it. All right, good as Rifa is here. All right, so uh, display setting. Okay, so I think you should be able to see it in full screen now. Uh, uh, hello again, everybody. and. Uh, in this presentation, I'm going to talk about neuroscience and language assessment. I'm using neuroscience as an overarching uh, terminology to refer to a number of different technologies. So I would like to start off by sharing this very interesting quotation with you uh, from Dehan, who is a neuroscientist. Uh, this is a great book. Um, he, he says that in the 21st century, the average person still has a, a, a better idea of how a car works than the inner functioning of his or her own brain, a curious and shocking state of affairs. And I would like to add to it that in, in the field that I'm coming from, I think this is probably uh, applicable to language assessment. Uh, we still have not been um, able to look into, for example, the uh, neurological mechanisms that uh, explain the uh, behavior of test takers under different test conditions. Um, so in my, in my uh, previous research, I have been a, a user, a practitioner who, who has used a, a number of uh, different uh, statistical and psychometric methods and also uh, scientometrics. Uh, of course, we know that these models are all um, uh, in a sense limited. And as Box and Draper said, they are wrong in a sense that the, uh, they, they are not uh, they do not provide a lot of information that is uh, that is going on in the test uh, taking process, uh, but they go on to say that the practical question is how wrong they have to be uh, uh, not uh, not to be uh, useful. And I want to add on to it another quotation from Miss Levy, uh, who says that, for example, IRT characterizations. IRT standing for item response theory of students and items are clearly simplifications and they say nothing about the processes by which students answer items. And as you know, in uh, fields like my field language assessment, there's a tradition in which we use IRT and other techniques like factor analysis and the same to reverse engineer the thought processes or the cognitive processes of test takers. As an example, since I, I do research on primarily listening comprehension, we, we subject the test items and listening comprehension to factor analysis. And then the clusters of items that emerge are then studied by experts or some think aloud analysis or some uh, retrospective analysis of test takers is done uh, to decide what these test items were probably measuring. And we refer to the factors as representations of uh, thought processes of test takers. Uh, so this is somehow in contrast with, uh, with uh, what Miss Levy has said in this quotation. Of course, he goes on to say, or to ask what is the nature of person parameters or theta and eta in latent variable models, where do they reside? Actually, I was intrigued to see this question around uh, tw uh, 2014, where when I started to think about uh, what is the nature of theta and, and eta, and do they have any ontological reality out there, or are they artifacts of our methodologies? So I thought uh, I would start you know, doing some research, uh, which was back then not very common in the field of language assessment. I started by, think, uh, by using eye tracking and uh, since about a few, four, three or four years ago, I have been 
uh, using uh, brain scanning or neuroimaging techniques. This is the output of some, some part of the output of the research that we have conducted and published in various journals. I'm going to present uh, the conclusions that we have drawn from some of these studies, but also uh, we'll try to elaborate on the challenges that, that we have encountered in these studies. So uh, the uh, neurophysiology of test takers is viewed within the framework that I'm going to define for you uh, uh, within four aspects. One is the brain, the other one is the eyes of the test taker, facial emotions and physiology. So, uh, most of the, these were actually discussed in the two previous, uh, uh, the two previous uh, presentations. So let's talk about these a little bit. Since the brain is perhaps less researched in the field of language assessment, I will uh, pause there and I will explain a little bit about how the brain functions and how we can measure the brain and claim that the measurements can be uh, used as representations of the thought processes of test takers. And these are the technologies that are basically uh, used for measuring the brain. That's the neuroimaging or FNES that I'm using. Uh, eye tracking is used for measuring gaze behaviors and facial emotional expressions and galvanic skin response can be used for emotions and uh, the measurement of emotions and feelings. They're, these two are different and I will elaborate as, as far as uh, time allows me. Now let's get started with the first technology that we are using uh, and that's called FNES, that's Functional Near Infrared Spectroscopy. Um, the idea of FNES is uh, a, a principle which is called neurovascular coupling. So this is the fundamental principle that is integral to FNES technology. And it's defined in this way, that the mechanism that links the transient neural activity to the subsequent change in the cerebral blood flow, which is regulated by both chemical signals and mechanical effects. And if you look at the photo on the right-hand side, which is from Heger and his colleagues, um, but basically we have a representation of a region of the brain which is active or which is activated as a result of an external stimulus when you get a part of the brain is activated the part needs two things oxygen and uh, and glucose or energy now our focus of course is on oxygen oxygen is carried by this uh, hero um, molecule called hemoglobin uh, so um, it binds itself to oxygen or O2 uh, molecules, and then it, it uh, basically rushes the oxygen to where it is it is needed. So using FNES, you can specify, you can identify the region that is now more active. How do we know it's more active? It, it basically allows us to measure uh, the amount of oxygen that is flowing to that certain part of the brain. And through this indirect observation, we can infer that this part of the brain is now uh, more active than the areas around around it and therefore it's more sensitive to the stimulus that we are um, for example uh, using in our experiment now there's another uh, concept which is called photon banana and in order to explain this i quickly want to elaborate on these two terminologies oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood uh, they basically absorb light especially uh, near infrared uh, light at different wavelengths. So this is the principle on which um, FNES rests. The, the machine that we used uh, is, is a brand called Nearsport that uses two wavelengths to distinguish the changes in the amount of oxygenated and deoxygenated uh, hemoglobin in the blood. So basically what uh, this machine does, put simply and very crudely, is to measure color differences in blood in the part of the brain that is more active. So using this information, we can infer the area is stimulated. Now, another concept is a photon banana. In, um, photons introduced at the scalp pass through most of the tissue and are either scattered or absorbed by the tissue, that's the brain tissue. And because a relatively uh, predictable quantity of photons follow a banana-shaped path, as you see, just like the one on the left-hand side, back to the surface of the, of the skin, uh, these photons uh, can be measured at the scalp using a photo detector. So whatever uh, whatever amount of light makes it back to the surface of the brain after you shine it to the brain, uh, uh, then the differences between uh, different wavelengths uh, can be measured and the inferences that I mentioned before can be drawn based on that. This is usually the setup that we use in our 
lab here. Um, there is an FNES machine. There is an eye tracker down there. I hope you can see that it's a small one. And also currently, recently we have been using galvanic skin response. So in the FNES studies that we have published so far, we have been con uh, concentrating on two regions of the brain. One is the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, which is right here in the forehead. And that is uh, associated with top-down processing or higher level thinking, critical thinking, and these kind of things, which are important in listening comprehension. And also two other regions which are associated with bottom-up processing, and they include inferior frontal gyrus and posterior medial temporal gyrus, which is close, both of which are closer to our auditory cortex. That's pretty much close to our ears. Um, now, um, the tests that we have been using in our experiments have two test methods. One is while listening performance test method, and the other one is post listening performance. For those of you who are familiar with language tests, think about WLPs as something like the IELTS test, and PLP is something like the TOEFL test, in the sense that in WLP, uh, you're supposed to read the test items and listen to the auditory stimuli at the same time and provide the answers almost at the same time. Whereas in the post-listening performance tests, uh, you don't see uh, the, the questions at the beginning of the test taking process. You uh, start to listen to the stimuli and you take notes if you like, and then you consult with your notes at the end of the presentation, and then you answer the questions which will appear only after the listening process is over. So you can see that this simultaneity of different cognitive processes is there in WLP, but that sort of simultaneity is absent in PLP. So the question is, does it uh, make a big difference at different levels, at, at the test taking level, that's at the test uh, score level, at the brain level, at the eye level, and so on and so forth? Well, our first uh, experiment that was published in computer assisted language learning showed that although test scores were not sensitive to the differences of test takers, of course, this was a small sample of around 25 people. Um, the test scores were not sensitive to those differences. Uh, the method that we used, that is the FNES technology, was pretty sensitive to different activation patterns of the brain. Uh, so the brain was functioning differently uh, under different test methods. Not only that, but also we found that the, the brain activation patterns of genders were pretty different with statistical, we, we reached statistical significance uh, for this one. And also we found that uh, those test takers who had high versus low ability test scores had uh, significantly different brain functions. So uh, we, we found that there was a uh, discrepancy between what the test scores were telling us and what the brain was doing. Now, the second study, I'm gonna skip this, these two slides in the interest of time. Um, Okay. Uh, the, the other I'm study that ten minutes. Go ahead. Ten minutes. Okay. Um, uh, the other study that actually confirmed uh, most of the conclusions that we had had drawn, but also it combined two technologies, FNES technology and, and eye tracking technology, and had a much larger sample, which took us a long time to finish and to complete. Uh, is this one, which was recently published in Language Testing? Our sample size was eighty and for those of you who are familiar with the FNES and uh, eye tracking research, you, you can probably guess how much time we have spent in designing this study and, and, and get 80 participants in our study. A long story short, we found that there were significant differences between uh, WLP and PLP tests. Even though the tests were equal and they were equated, the, uh, the questions were more or less the same. The linguistic features of the two tests were more or less the same. The fact that you administer a test in WLP uh, versus PLP just makes significant difference. Um, we found that there was lower activity levels across brain regions, which support comprehension during WLP tests. Um, and we concluded that the WLP tests seem to impose a lower cognitive load on test takers than PLP. And previous research actually shows uh, a different uh, or a kind of uh, contrasting um, conclusion if you compare it with our conclusions that we have drawn here. We also found that gaze behaviors in WLP 
tests uh, suggested that there was some sort of keyword matching and what John Field called uh, shallow listening. Now, I want to move on to the emotion because as Bruno and Brian mentioned in the first presentation, uh, there is a lot of uh, research on cognitive processes of test takers, but we hardly hear about emotional and stress. Of course, the strategy has been researched, but when it comes to emotions and feelings, we hardly hear much uh, uh, research about uh, these two concepts. I'm not saying that there is no research on that, but relative, there's a relatively a, a fewer um, number of publications on these concepts. Emotions are different from feelings, and in, in our field, we often use them interchangeably, but if you go to a field like psychology, emotions are defined as neurophysiological reactions that are unleashed by an external or internal stimulus. So emotions are non-conscious changes in the somatic state of mm -hmm. us. So we're not conscious about it. Right now, emotions might be going all, all over through, through my body and my, I might not be conscious about it. Uh, but feelings are subjective. I have, uh, I'm conscious about them, and I can perceive them. And, um, and but it's it's subjective, as I mentioned before. And we, I can basically self appraise my own feelings. So if I, if a researcher is using questionnaire to measure, for example, a certain emotion, technically this is not the right way of doing it. In order to measure emotions, we need to use some technologies that will allow us to tap into those uh, processes that are subconscious and are, are not under our control. So one study that we have conducted uh, uh, by one of my students, Joey, basically showed she used a uh, face reader, which is an, uh, a kind of uh, face reading technology used, uh, which has been developed based on artificial intelligence and machine learning and also sentiment analysis. She found that test takers performed better when the stimuli embedded happy rather than sad sentiments. So this was a very well controlled sort of experiment and we wanted to figure out whether the emotions that are embedded in stimuli can affect the test performance of test takers. And we found, yes, we found positive evidence for that. And finally, uh, galvanic skin response is another technology that we are using in order to measure emotions rather than feelings, as I mentioned before. Um, when someone is aroused due to any sort of uh, external stimuli or uh, even inter internal stimuli like thinking, um, the skin conductance changes. Skin conductance changes as a result of perspiration. And sometimes this perspiration is not even uh, felt by us. I mean, right now, as I am speaking with you, there might be some perspirations on my fingertips and I cannot even feel it. A technology called galvanic skin response technology can actually measure the changes in skin conductance and let us know whether this person has been aroused and as a result of the stimuli or or not and this is one of the uh, machines that we're using right now it's called uh, shimmer and two of my phd students are actually now experimenting with this and we are trying to triangulate this the sort of data that we're collecting from this technology with eye tracking and brain scanning uh, I still don't have anything else to, to say here, but I think next year uh, there will probably be some sort of data and finding which I'll be very happy to share with you. A long story short, what I would like to say is that based on our current uh, research, um, I believe that test takers are not um, are persons, not just cognitive processes. So as uh, the previous presenters mentioned, uh, in, or, um, in order to find out what is going on under test conditions, we need to look into several different dimensions of test taking, such as cognitive uh, processes, emotional, motivational, and neurophysiological processes to create this holistic um, image of test taking. Um, of course, previous research on concepts like construct validity, uh, nomothetic span, um, um, the uh, Neuro, uh, the nomological network proposed by different people have stressed uh, that different different types of validity are important. What I would like to add on here is that I think it it would be plausible to think to think about a concept called neurocognitive validity or neurophysiological validity, if you will. And the concept is like this: the convergent 
uh, it refers to the converging evidence that different test methods measuring the same construct elicit the same cognitive or neurocognitive or neurophysiological processes. Meaning that if you want to com uh, compare the effects of test methods, uh, relying heavily upon test scores will not really give us a lot of information. A lot of information is actually missing because the models that we use to um, model variance in uh, test, test taking data like IRT, uh, factor analysis and so on and so forth, um, are not aware of the processes that basically took place before the test scores were generated. So in order to add on, uh, to add more richness to the data that we have, I think we have to look into the process that resulted in, in, in the test scores. And like I said, in our previous research, we found that there's often, at least in our research, there's often uh, little correlation or no correlation between the process data and test taking data. And I think that's a huge question mark here, which needs to be addressed in uh, uh, um, research in the future. Finally, I would like to add that- Sorry, one minute. Okay, neurocognitive validity should be contextualized. And this is something that another group of my students are now researching. I think uh, the environment has a huge impact on our brain. There's a lot of research that shows that kids who, for example, grow up in, in environments where there is environmental injustice, environmental racism, there's too much pollutants, there's too much neurotoxins, the brain is shaped in different ways and that affects their academic performance as well as their language ability, which is measured by some tests. Um, I think it's very important to look into neurocognitive validity uh, within the lenses of the social and environmental factors and not just uh, summarize it to uh, what is happening in the brain of the test taker. Because if, again, in our research, we have found that if we limit our understanding to the test taker and, and ignore the environments and the socio-cultural factors in which the, the test taker is situated, uh, we will uh, not be able to um, explain a, a huge amount of variance that is attributed to these higher level uh, factors for example, level two or even level three factors. So um, that brings me to the end of this presentation. Uh, you know, I just wanted to say that interface webinars, and I hope there will be more webinars in the, in the near future, are meant to um, uh, combine these three uh, um, fields of research, artificial intelligence, neuroscience and validity. In this presentation, in this series of presentations, we have taken our first step and I look forward to uh, more presentations like this in the future. And I think that brings me to the end of this presentation. Just wanted to thank these people who had uh, key roles in the, in the studies that I presented before, these people and these fund providers. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through all the list and I would like to thank you very much for your attention. All right, so uh, that brings us to the end of uh, presentation time. And I think uh, we have some questions. Right, uh, so let's, let's get started with questions. Uh, what I'm gonna do here is just, you know, I'm double hatting as you see, uh, but this time around, I'm, what I'm gonna do is just to play the role of the moderator. Um, I'm gonna communicate the questions that have been raised here and I would like to invite our presenters to contribute their thought, thoughts and insight uh, in the Q&A. So the first question that was raised uh, was by Franz. Um, Franz is, I'm gonna read it out. I think this is for the first presenters for Bruno and Brian. Um, so thank you for this great presentation. Coming back to Brian's image of the boy with the head in his, uh, with the head in his head and the fact that our sensors don't pick up on his process at the moment. I have a question about retrospective methods such as uh, stimulated recall protocols. How useful do you think verbal protocol analysis is for researching response processes? I know verbal protocols are often laughed at by psycholinguists okay. uh, as they think that they don't provide any useful data. Over to you. Uh, well, I'm just, uh, it was addressed to Brian, but Brian, if you'll allow me one moment, I just, I do want to mention one thing. 
Um, the, the, the matter of verbal pro protocols, I'm, I'm not sure if all psycholinguists uh, believe that, uh, but certainly I, I've met some who do. But uh, one of my uh, dear friends and, 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 uh, and colleagues, collaborators, uh, Professor Jose Luis Padilla from Spain has worked on um, and with, with his colleagues has worked on what one might call verbal protocol type methods uh, in, uh, uh, in response processes. I've uh, written some lovely papers around this. Uh, I thought Jose Luis may even be on, on the, um, on the, uh, on the, on, on the uh, call today, but, uh, and Isabel Benitez and, and, and others doing some beautiful work on that. And a colleague of mine, by the name of Jackie Layton at the University of Alberta, here in Edmonton, Canada. Uh, Jackie's done some absolutely lovely work on the bounds of the inferences and claims one can use with verbal protocols, verbal reports, the different kinds of probing. So yeah, I'm not sure it's all, it certainly isn't, doesn't have as harsh a reputation as some areas would have. There are limitations and I think both Jackie and uh, Jose Luis, who actually contributed a chapter to the book I edited in 2017 with Anita Hubley on exactly these kinds of topics. So there is there is a body of literature on this that yeah. that says they are useful with bounds. Uh, and I and I think that's really interesting, Bruno, because the question I suppose would be what do um, uh, think aloud uh, cognitive protocols, etc., verbal protocols, um, what do they add? And I think there's a tendency when we, when we're, as researchers, for example, if we're if we're collecting eye tracking data, to expect, uh, or, uh, to expect people to comment on that data, uh, whereas of course, um, you know, uh, people are not sufficiently aware um, of their eye movements to make any uh, reasonable comment about uh, eye movements. However, what we can do is we can ask them to. Uh, make other explanations, for example, about their behavior, uh, the, the sense of meaning, uh, uh, and so on. I'll just give one brief example on that, which um, cropped up just yesterday, which is on, um, which was, I was looking at data on, um, uh, on, on, a, on a test design and whether people um, use the help, the help key on the, um, on the test. Um, what we found is that the children in schools, this was children in primary schools, were not tending to use the help option. And so the question was, well, did you see the did you see the help key? Um, and so I asked in, in, in Think Aloud, did I, I ask the children, you know, you didn't use this help key when you seem to be struggling. Uh, did, didn't you see the help key? Uh, and uh, one child reported, well, I know it's there. But uh, here in this class, we believe that if we use the help key, uh, the machine will give us a lower score. Um, and, and I was quite amazed by that and said, well, you know, I have no idea whether that's the case. And I asked the teachers and the teachers said, no, there's no way that that would be the case, that they would, it would give them a lower score. So it's a misinterpretation. Anyhow, yesterday, I just happened to be speaking with one of the designers of that test. So I shared this story. And, and the designer said, yes, in fact, the, the student is completely right. We would have given them a lower score because the CAT design um, uses um, the log data, et cetera, the, the keystrokes. And if they, if they uh, happen to, to use the help key, uh, we route them differently. And as a result, give them a different score. So the child was absolutely correct. So th this is the kind of information that you can sometimes get from think alouds that you would never get from, for example, the eye tracking data. You don't, you can see that they haven't looked at the help and they haven't used the help from log data and eye tracking, but it doesn't tell you why they haven't. And I think there's a nice example of, uh, of why that might be the case. Okay, can I add one, Brian, may I add one more thing to, to your comment? Um, it's fascinating that the image was of this young boy with his um, head in his hands. And immediately we go to retrospective verbal protocols. But, you know, to my dear friend, the anthropologist, uh, we actually are born with a sensor. <laughs> any, any observer, any thoughtful uh, um, social scientist, anthropologist, any thoughtful human could interpret that distress. Mm -hmm. We don't need a computer to interpret that. And I'm not sure any AI system is going to do much better than uh, a thoughtful 
human observers. So maybe another sensor is humans. Uh, I, I, I agree. And, and I, I do think that, you know, um, this links in, I think, with very much with what uh, Tamina was talking about, about explainable AI. Uh, and also some of the things that that uh, um, that, that that Vahid is talking about, but actually, you know, the the, the thing is, we do get these gaps in data, uh, and it's very helpful to notice the gaps in data because, in a way, it punctuates this perhaps overconfidence that we have about the um, rigor and uh, fine detail of sensor-based measures. Um, because if we actually say, I mean, I've used these kind of examples before from my research to in discussions with people who use log data to say, hey, guys, you know, there's a lot going on here, but there is no log data and you don't know what's going on. But I do because I was there and I asked the person what was going on. Uh, and I, I, it's slightly cheeky, but it's actually a very important reminder to people that they're fallible and that their data is fallible and it's not holistic and it's partial. And these points that Tamina was making about the importance of multimodal kind of uh, analysis. Um, but I think I don't want to establish some kind of hierarchy here. But what I want to try and do is to say that the data we put together is it's almost like a jigsaw of data. Uh, and it's an interpretive jigsaw. And um, so, for example, I've used um, webcam data and eye tracking data. And uh, one of the, the, the examples I, I, I would like to share is um, watching a young boy who looked like he was quite distressed, trying over and over to get an, an, an item correct. And he kept getting it incorrect and they kept having another go at, uh, it was a sort of gamified item. And afterwards we said, look, I said, look, at, as an anthropologist or whatever, I, my interpretation was, you look quite distressed by this item. You've obviously found it quite disturbing. And he said, no, actually quite the opposite. I was really engrossed in this item. I really, I wanted to nail it. I could see I was getting it wrong and I really wanted to get it right. And I, it was one of the most enjoyable items there. So I think, you know, to come back to Bruno's point, even, you know, the anthropologist is not able to have a holistic where, you know, anthropologists are not godlike. They, they, just because they're there doesn't mean they have a, 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 a holistic and a impartial interpretation. So I think, you know, whatever the sensors, whatever the probes, whatever the data we're using, there is no escape from validation. It comes back to, to, to the paper that Bruno and I presented. You know, validation has to be built into that. And sorry to take the, to the floor when I shouldn't do, but um, as, as Vahid was presenting, I found that, that that tension runs through it because you've got these incredibly uh, uh, um, uh, um, exciting um, uh, sources of, of process data. And yet, as we go through, I'm aware of, for example, recent, I mean, the first generation of papers coming out about these measures is very kind of exploratory and very exciting. You know, we have these new ways to do it. Uh, we can collect this cool data. But the next generation of, 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 of literature, which is coming out now, is critiquing this stuff. There was a paper that came out just a few days ago about the uses of, um, uh, about galvanic skin response, EDA, uh, uh, and the difficulties in interpreting uh, rigorously and valid, uh, valid interpretations of EDA data. And after a rigorous literature review saying, this is actually way too hard at the moment. We don't have easy solutions. You know, the interpretations of, of galvanic skin response are highly problematic. And as a result, if we want to validate them, we have a really big task. And similarly about the interpretations of emotions, there was a wonderful and pathbreaking, uh, rigorous, enormous review of um, the automated emotion um, a lit, um, um, a software such as Face Reader by Barrett et al. 2019, which essentially critiques not only the measures themselves, but the underlying theory that informs those measures. Uh, and, you know, and, and these days, you know, people who are using, you know, for example, Face Reader have got the problem of the fact that there are these powerful critiques that say, guys, you can you can use it as much as you want, but the underlying theory says this is not valid these interpretations of, uh, these particular interpretations of you know, these emotional states uh, is deeply problematic. So I, I think the presentations today seem to me to capture both the, uh, the potential for you know, these multimodal measures and how exciting they are, but also the need to, I think, if I could say, validate them from the perspective that Bruno and I were presenting, but also explain them uh, and explain how they work and explain their fairness. 
uh, uh, as, as, as Tamina was saying. Sorry to jump in and take the floor there, but I thought it was a nice opportunity to kind of sum up some of the sort of uh, interesting uh, um, perspectives and tensions running through the presentation. It was great. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answers. Well, I just want to add my two cents here very briefly about the uh, question of think aloud and similar so-called qualitative based uh, research. Um, I think, as uh, you guys mentioned, it's, it's a good idea to uh, triangulate your data with them for further validation. Uh, we should always um, remember the limitation of all methods that we use uh, with qualitative techniques. And I, I'm just going to use the word qualitative here. I hope it doesn't offend anyone. Um, I think one of the uh, important limitations that we need to take into account is that they're based, they're based heavily on the storage capacity of our working memory. Because as we are listening to someone and as we uh, are, are reading something or we are interpreting some kind of stimulus out there, the, uh, this, the different pieces of stimuli register themselves in our working memory. And after they're being processed, they're imme they immediately vanish because they need to uh, evacuate the working memory to, to give more room for new, new coming information. So uh, what the, the test taker or the person who is attending our experiment can do is to have access to that in piece of information that's still there in their working mem memory or has registered itself in their what they call working long-term memory, according to some scholars like Erickson and his, his friend. Um, but beyond that, um, a lot of other subconscious or unconscious, if you will, processes happen during test taking about which we're not aware. So we, we should draw that line and we should uh, be very, very specific and clear about what we really want this sort of data to tell us, not to uh, overestimate or underestimate its, its capacity. Yeah, and if, if I can add to that, uh, Vahid, it's, it also is something that um, uh, that are um, uh, that um, uh, Tamina mentioned, which is this notion that the there there needs to be that these I mean any derived um, and response process variable needs to have explanatory power and explanation. I think I mean this is I've been pushing this idea of it, you know, my own view of my own th uh, theory, this sort of explanation focused view of validity. And so in that 2017 uh, volume, um, my colleagues and I uh, looked at response uh, response time and, you know, um, it challenges this inevitability that response time or any of these measures um, be they self-report, um, memory recalls, uh, verbal protocols, um, they need to have explanatory power. And if there is an explanatory power, uh, then then there is some inherent, from a scientific point of view, there's some inherent um, validity to them. And so, and I think that's what you're saying as well, uh, Vahid and Brian, and it really brings forward uh, Tamina's point of view, and it's, it's I mean, I like it. It's what I've been pushing for for, you know, 17, nearly 20 years now. This sort of developing this explanation folks view of validity, um, and so yeah, I I think that's what that's part of the of the validation of the of these of these measures as, as well. Yeah. Very good. Thank you, uh, Bruno. Since uh, Tamini has left, I actually took some notes here, and I wanted to check with you and Brian about. The presentation that uh, that you just delivered. In the meantime, I would like to invite the audience to uh, type in their questions. Feel free to write anything that you would like to. I'm sure uh, our two wonderful guests will be very happy to answer your questions. So my question goes back to uh, the uh, one of the in one of the slides you were pointing to the effect of cognitive emotional and strategic behavior. And you were also pointing to the tension that if a test developer um, doesn't really care that much about the effects of emotions and strategy on test taking, in other words, if they have not defined it at all in their test development uh, process, but, but we find evidence that emotions and strategies 
also affect test performance. Now, how do we interpret the validity of the interpretations and uses of these test scores? Because Ultimately, those emotions and strategies will affect test scores somehow. And the test developer was not aware of that or didn't really care about it. You know. Well, I, I can give you my response to, to that whole strat. And this applies to emotion and other things. I, I have been advocating for um, what would be decry de described in the philosophy of science literature as a, a form of, of a form of abductive reasoning. So if one positions themselves from an abductive reasoning point of view and you find these responses, these associations with an emotional response, then as we move this towards a science of measurement, which is what, in my opinion, the quest for explanation is, is one hall, hallmark of a, of a science, um, then one really has an obligation to ask the question, uh, how and in what way are, um, are our emotional responses um, shaping or forming the the meaning of the test score, the interpretability, the use, uh, perhaps even looking at matters of consequences in, in the in, in test scores. Vahid, I, I hope I haven't gone around your question. Does that does that move in a direction? Does that does that help at all? It does, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's my understanding. I mean, we can somehow link it to construct irrelevant variants or sources of construct. Yeah. Variants. See, I, I, I've been a, a major proponent of Sam Messick's work um, for decades now, and I, I was so honored to publish his last paper before he passed away in an edited volume in 98, I think it was my an edited volume I published in, in 1998. Um, and, and Messick did a lot of terrific things, but one of the, the, the concerns I have with some of Messick's work, and it reflects the, the, the spirit of psychology at the time in cognitive science, is that Messick really talked about mental probes a lot. That was the language that was being advocated as our mental probes, which again now gets into perhaps um, a narrow definition of what is a response process. So it's mental probes, the response processes as mental probes, and now it's method that defines it, but also this mentalistic mental probe idea. Uh, the other thing that I was really disappointed with some of the writing, um, and it even seeps into some of my own writing from the um, mid um, early parts of the 1990s and, and the, to the mid, mid 1990s, is a lot of this sort of hypo hypothetical de deductivism that, go that goes on and, and that validation is being cast as a form of hypothetical deductivism. And, and if I can quote one of my, uh, my one of my former mentors, uh, Bill Rosenblum, and uh, the title of his paper, The American Psychologist, many decades ago, was uh, you know, you know hypothet hypothetical de 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 deductivism is a fraud. And so, if you're going to go strictly now, that was exaggerated. I'm not sure I'd go that far, but the strictly confirmatory type hypothetical deductive kind of testing of theories it's 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 not going to get us anywhere and in fact it's problematic and so um that's why i've been pushing for not only explanation focus but framing this with an at within an abductive a type of abductive stance and, and point of view um yeah brian you wanted to say something well um yeah it, it doesn't quite follow on but it's on this theme that you were asking about um so apologies know if it's um we can yeah, come back great. to those themes if necessary um i mean uh, vahid's point about the role of emotion i think it's a really important point i mean i i, I although um i i made this point that the automated uh, motion detection is quite problematic from a theoretical and methodological perspective it, it, you know it's unfortunately the some of the software that people are used to using because it's there because it's available is problematic from a from a, a validity point of view um, and as a result it challenges us to think about how we interpret and use emotional data which is a you know it's an early i see it as a sort of early an early cycle of learning and reflection about okay we can collect this stuff but we really need to think very carefully about how it's interpreted and used emotions are not the kind of boxed kind of um, explanations, you know, see somebody smiling, therefore they are happy type of, uh, and it's, it's, it's crass. Um, 
However, it's, it, it becomes very clear that emotions are actually hugely important when we look at response processes. Uh, uh, and I, I just give a brief example of that. Thank you, uh, Brian. I, I, I'm glad to hear that. I mean, I, as you know, I've been beating that drum for a while. Yeah, so yeah. I'm I mean, I know it's in your, in, in your uh, definition of response that. process as well. Emotions, uh, feelings, emotions are right in there. If we look at the example of um, the development of large, the use of process data, for example, in large scale assessments, one example is the huge literature, explosion of literature in relation to the OECD, PISA tests, et cetera, and PIAC and, and so on, so, and some of the other large scale assessments. Uh, there's this huge um, mass of data, and, it, and it's partly from what Bruno's saying, we can collect that data, so we might as well use it for you know, validation processes, et cetera. But one of the things that is not available from, from those large scale assessments is emotional data. But what becomes clear, and I, this is what I teased out, for example, in my ethnographic work around PIAC, which is published work, um, that uh, issues around mental fatigue and boredom were hugely important, and were and are hugely important, for example, in the, in the PIAC assessment, the, the, the uh, adult skills assessment of the OECD. And not just in PIAC, but also probably also in, 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 in PISA. And so I was getting comments from, from in retrospect of think aloud. I was observing uh, observing emotions in people, you know, the embodied emotions as I was observing as the ethnographer. And as I asked people about it, they were saying, well, things like, well, I skipped this item because I was so I, I was so worn down by it. It was boring, you know, and people said very openly, oh, no, not another one of those items. I, I, it's just too much. And I've got a lovely transcript in one of my papers where a person says, look, it's just too much. I just had to skip it. And so clearly that, you know, the emotions were, were, were impacting. And in fact, when you look at the psychometric data around, for example, skipping and item performance, what you see is a massive tail off towards the end of assessments when people are just getting fatigued and bored uh, by essentially designs which are not effectively, either the assessment is too long and I think one of the things that people are taking on board now is shortening cat-based assessments is extremely helpful. So, for example, some of the work coming out about the Duolingo uh, language test, for example, has, has been saying, look, it's more valid because it's shorter, not less valid because it's shorter, because, uh, because you're otherwise you're getting into these fatigue and boredom type of issues. So there's a very interesting debate going on there about, about you know, length of testing, standardization, etc. But when you look at some of the designs, from a user experience point of view, the designs have to stimulate people's engagement, and their you know their uh, you know emotional effect is a huge important factor. But what, digging deeper into the designs, when you look at cat-based designs, uh, for example, when I looked at the cat-based design for PIAC, what I was what I saw was that actually so, they had this multi multi-stage cat design, which meant that uh, some of the a proportion of the of, of the test takers had to take three sets, three, three modules of the same, of the same, uh, uh, the same um, topic in order to distribute the, 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 the items equally across the, so everybody is getting the same number of items across the whole population, et cetera. And people just found it massively boring uh, and, and they were disengaged. So, you know, and so you get this huge literature on response times, but it's saying nothing about this emotional effect at all. And I think, you know, we, and the reason why there isn't a huge literature on it is because people weren't collecting the data. So, so it really get, makes us think very carefully about, you know, this, this point about, well, we, we're using the data because we can easily collect it versus, well, what's going on and what might be useful data that we should be collecting. And I think as Vahid's saying, the emotional data needs to be incorporated. We need to theorize it in, in, our, in our validation. And, 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 and we really do need to move uh, to, I mean, again, I'm beating this drum. I mean, uh, he talked about it's a theme in all of the all of the presentations. Um, I mean, all, in all of them was moving towards what I, what I would characterize as a science of measurement, and a science of measurement does, in fact, focus on um, an explanatory focus. So you take response variables, and and like what he was doing in his present, he was. And what I really found fascinating, Vahid, what you're doing is you're using the, 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 the neuro psychological markers, these neurophysiological markers, and you're using them to build an explanatory theory. 
Is the explanatory theory you're building final? Far from it, and you acknowledge that. But you're working toward developing and using these response processes, not just golly gee, there's a clock on the computer, so it's inevitable that I have to use it. What you're saying is let's add new sensors. That's what Brian's saying. I love Brian's idea that's emerged out of the theme of the presentations. And and in uh, in Tamir's presentation, looking at explanation, in her case, explanatory AI, uh, AI is leagues in the direction where we need to go. Um, this, is, this is so what's exciting at this interface, and maybe I'm reading it the heat, I'm reading it to flatter my own ego. And if so, I suppose I'm only human. Um, uh, but at, at the same time, I do see this move towards it. And I, I'm, I'm excited. I've been beating this drum. I've been writing about it. And I've been trying to develop theories around it, um, around things like diff. But it's not really about diff. It's about un validity and validation more generally and understanding these processes. And, and I think it's a major major direction in this first step of this interface is to say let's let's get on and start developing actual science of measurement which is what Crumbeck and Meal were trying to do in 55 except their view of science and explanation was reflected in 1955 as we move forward doing the work of you know integrating Vahid your work Brian Denny Borsboom Mike Kane Bob Mislevy my own contributions to this argument is moving towards a science, in my language, a science of, of, of measurement, which in which the response variables, the space, that space-time gap becomes, and the context begins to actually move to an understanding of, 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 of score variation, of scores, and, and at either at one level or at at the end, it's not really level. I, I, it's proximity to score reports. I don't like the term level. Uh -huh. It's proximity to score report. So I, I, I'll stop there, Vahid, and and, and uh, stop beating the drum. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bruno. Uh, it was really wonderful. I enjoyed listening to you. Uh, but unfortunately, in the interest of time, we have to yeah, absolutely. Ask, uh, call today. Uh, I I would like to thank uh, Bruno, Brian, and uh, Tahmina for taking the time. Uh, and for uh, sharing their wonderful ideas with us. I wish we had more time to. And Vahid, I'm going to interrupt you because I we want to thank you and your colleagues in, in Singapore for, for, for bringing this together. Um, I, this, this is, again, you've made such lovely contributions to the field and this is another one that I think these kinds of conversations and taking these interfaces towards the future. There needs to be a, a, a thanks to you as well and your colleagues. Thank so. you so much. And on that note, I'd also like to thank our committee here, ELL Talks and Seminar Committee, uh, for help, helping to organize the session. Feruz is here. I'd like to thank you, Feruz, and also Anita and other colleagues on, on the committee. Uh, it's been a wonderful day. And uh, it's raining here in Singapore, Friday, 5 o'clock. I hope... <laughs> I hope uh, you guys will, are going to have a wonderful weekend too. Um, will, so I don't have any final remarks to make really. On that note, I'd like to say goodbye to all of you and wish you the very best and, and a very uh, pleasant weekend. Goodbye. Great. Thank you. Bye.